The sea wind snaps in the canvas overhead as your boat plies the blue waves towards the coast of Castile. You face down the mutinous captain of the ship in front of you, him and his bloodthirsty crew. What? The valuable artifact that you have in your hand. Cut two. Lightning flashes across the night sky as you dance across the terracotta roofs of a town in Vodachi, attempting to fight off the deadly musketeers sent by Le Emperor to keep you silent. Cut two. The fancy palaces of Montaigne, where you burst into the quarters of a courtesan, the perfumed scents tickling your nose. You're cornered and there's no way out, unless you can tap into Porte Magic tear a hole through reality and travel to a totally different part of the world. Yes, this is 7th C, and today we are talking with John Wick, the creator of said game. One of my uh, personal favorite RPGs, so I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, John, do you want to say hello? Hello! How are you? <laughs> hey, John. How's it going? Pretty good. How are you guys? Great. Very, very good. This is David Crennan, and I'm here with Dom Zook. Mm-hmm. You guys, of course, are listening to the Saving Throw Show. Seventh C, for those of you who don't know, is a tabletop role-playing game of swashbuckling and intrigue, exploration, and adventure, taking place on the continent of Thea, a land of magic and mystery inspired by our own, by our own Europe. Players take the roles of heroes, thrown into global conspiracies and sinister, sinister plots, exploring ancient ruins of a race long vanished and protecting the rightful kings and queens of Thea from murderous villains. So it is your swashbuckling dreams come true, basically. Yep. I love it. Yeah, it's, it's super good. This is the second edition core rule book, actually, that I was just reading off the back of. It was just launched on, I believe it was the most successful RPG Kickstarter to date. I thought That's I correct. Heard. Yeah, raised something like 1.3, almost $1.4 million, uh, way in excess of the targeted goal. So obviously people react strongly to swashbuckling. <laughs> <laughs> We've established swashbuckling is the unifying factor for everyone. Well, swashbuckling, but and what sets Seventh Sea apart is also nice is that there's, uh, as I was just reading about sorcery, there's intrigue, mm-hmm. there are monsters beyond imagination. Um, it's a really deep world. It's a mixture of amazing genres, and you can really do anything with it that you want to. So, John, just to have people get to know you a little bit, uh, what is your history with this game? Can you tell us a little bit about where the idea for Seventh Sea came from and why you decided to reboot it? Yeah, the uh, um, the idea came from my wife at the time. Jennifer and I were at a spaghetti Italian restaurant, <laughs> talking about and and just talking about things in general. Uh, I had been working at AEG for a few years, been doing Samurai for a while, and and the company was looking to do something new. And uh, she mentioned that she wanted to do the William Blake role playing game. <laughs> and, you know, and uh, and I was like, I have no idea what that looks like. But uh, no, I started, you know, thinking about things. And I was also reading a, uh, a book, uh, a really good book called Isaac Newton, The Last Sorcerer, which oh, was a, a nonfiction book or is this fictional? No, it's a it's a fiction. It's it's nonfiction. It's it's a it's a biography of Isaac Newton, and huh. it talks a lot about his alchemy work, yes. and uh, and how he viewed alchemy as the real art, and this physics thing was like a hobby that that he couldn't waste his time with. <laughs> oh man, that's not something and, that's going to turn up like that in my life at some point. I hope yeah, where yeah. people will be like, "All oh, this trash you've been throwing out, David's true art," and I'll be like, "But no, my passion is role playing games." Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, and so the combination of those things kind of brought us to the pitch, which was Isaac Newton, Man of Action, which <laughs> yes. was what we wanted to do, and nice. that eventually turned into Seven C. So if you weren't on board already, surely that has gotten you on board. Isaac Newton, Isaac Mutant, Man of Action. Uh, yep. Uh, sorry, Isaac Newton, man of action. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, so I guess I, I'm going to get into a couple kind of crunchy questions that I personally have. Uh, one of the things that really sets this world apart is the incredibly deep uh, world story, the, the world building that goes into it. You're not just playing in this generic fantasy world. Um, 
it's much more akin to I guess if you've only played D&D before it'd be akin to like the Forgotten Realms campaign where there are novels there are reams of these source books which explain each individual country and each individual country has their own specific take and flavor and culture um, and then running through all of it there was kind of almost like a meta storyline that you had going on as well mm-hmm. um, in first edition I know that there was kind of a storyline that played out through the collectible card game if you guys remember that I remember the CCG for 7th C was pretty awesome uh, <laughs> I, it wasn't one I could afford to collect, but I had friends who did, and I was always like, oh, so awesome. But um, there was, like, a way to actually resolve a storyline kind of depending on the people who played in that CCG. Am I right about that? Some yeah, it, we, it was some, yeah, it was something we picked up from um, something we are doing with Legend of the Five Rings, which was that the, uh, uh, you know, the players could interact with the storyline. It wasn't like White Wolf's storyline, which was written solely in house and you know and, and and you know it was kind of like isolationistic we we were very much about the players having an impact on on the world yeah and so we we opened that up to story tournaments which were uh events that changed elements of the world through the ccg and and at the time um i didn't know how to do that with a role-playing game i, I had no idea Right. Uh, since then, the internet came along, and uh, now I have a very good idea how to, how to do that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. We should raise that. That was happening back in, like, uh, 1999, 2000, you know, 2001, like, way back before the internet was a force in the world. Like, you yeah. were kind of, I mean, there's maybe was something other than you that I'm not aware of, but you guys were kind of, like, the original, like, the fans will influence this uh, game setting. So I guess my, the question I'm trying to lead into is, Coming into the second edition now, um, yeah. you've got a lot of these NPCs. Everything's in place for a really epic story to, to play out. Do you have a goal or a desire to kind of return to that? The fans will shape a meta story, or are you more content to just let each person run their own game and it'll be their game? Well, we'd like to do both. Um, one, one of the ways that we're going to do that is through organized play. Great. And uh, we're working on that with a couple of people in the company now. Uh, can't talk too much about it, but we do know that we are going to have organized play. Players, players have already influenced the world. At, uh, at Gen Con, we playtested the idea of world events, which was uh, a story that, or an adventure that uh, the players would have input on or you know, their choices would, would change things. Yeah. So, for example, one of the stories that we had that, that I'm writing up now is uh, they were involved with one of the secret societies in Thea, which is the Invisible College. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, and uh, the Invisible College is trying to maintain and protect technology and science while the Inquisition is in charge of things and downplaying all of that. And at the end of the adventure, they had a, a scientific journal mm-hmm. that they were smuggling out of the country. And uh, they asked, uh, and I asked them, I said, okay, this is the end of the adventure. You get to decide which technology is in this scientific journal. Ooh. And uh, we had a few options for them, and we asked them to come up with options, too, and we had a whole list of things. One of the things they want, uh, a few of the things on the list were dirigibles, or not dirigibles, but hot air balloon technology. Ooh, how cool. Um, one of the other choices was the spectrograph. Yeah. Um, spectrograph. But the... But the choice that they went with was, I was really proud, the choice that they came up with and that they voted on was the uh, chronometer, was the watertight chronometer. (laughs) Which is sailors out there who are like going to be like, how can I map longitude accurately? (laughs) Exactly. So and, and, you know, for those who don't know, the watertight chronometer was the tool that we used to, for the first time, correctly navigate, correctly uh, uh, make longitude. And it was, you know, and that's the decision they went with. And so that is what the new technology in Thea is going to be when we when we uh, release that to the general playership. That's extremely awesome. exciting. I love that. Oh, man. So that's great. So I didn't know that you had actually already started doing that at Gen Con. So obviously uh, it sounds like that's something you're excited to continue as uh, the new books roll out. Yeah, it's been, you know, it was really fun. We did three of them. And uh, in one case, they we picked a uh, a town or a, a city off the map, 
and they got to do a round robin of essentially building the town from scratch. Wow. And so the players created a, you know, created a city on the map. Wow. And that was really cool. Can you say what city that is? Just so I can squee out about it when I see it in the books. <laughs> I don't have the map in front of me, so I can't. Uh, okay. It's, uh, but uh, yeah, it's it, it it's one of the. Uh, let's see what was it? it was one of the, was it one of the mountain cities? Yeah, it was a mountain city. So it, uh, if people who are listening to this want to get involved and try and have their voice heard and influence the game world, is it just people should show up at conventions and see you guys there and join in that, or will there be another way to? Um, to influence it there is going to be another way to influence it and it's going to be through our our organized play program hmm. and essentially what it's going to be is we're kind of building we we, we built Thea, the continent that that 7c takes place on we rebuilt it from not necessarily from scratch for second edition but we really did rebuild it and we left a lot of the spaces blank hmm. uh, uh, in the 90s, we, you know, world building was a huge thing. And I think that we really didn't leave a lot of room on the map for the players in the in the 90s version. But in this one, we're, we're leaving a lot of space. And the players are going to are the players in the organized play are going to fill that space for us and kind of like make the official John Wick Presents campaign setting while all that empty space you know, for your local tabletop, you know, for your tabletop game gives you and your players a lot of space to fill it up on your own for, you know, for your campaign. Yeah. And that, that was the kind of the choice that we went with for that. I love it. Yeah. There have been some real changes to the uh, campaign world. Um, obviously the Sarmatian Commonwealth. Let me actually back up a little bit for people who uh, are maybe totally new to seventh C. So it's set in Thea, which we've mentioned a couple of times, which is essentially the way I kind of talk to it about people is it's not Europe. It's a uh, kind of an alternate version of Europe, of Western Europe from the 17th century. If you look at the map, it looks like Europe kind of has been tweaked a little bit. And there's a lot of nations that have kind of the same size and shape and similar names to places you might recognize. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we have Montaigne, which is not France. Castile, which is not Spain. Um, there's a not Catholic church that's uh, kind of in charge of everything. We also see Russia. It's called Usura. You know, not to not to um, minimize how rich and interesting that campaign world is, but it really is this really interesting fresh take where when you're flipping through the core rule book, uh, which looks like this for those of you who can see it, um, the bulk of the 7th C core rule book that came out is cultural and uh, historical grounding in these different countries to really invest the players in the world. So I bring that up by way of talking about you've added some interesting new countries. Um, well, at least one, the Sarmatian Commonwealth, which, as far as I'm aware, never showed up in first edition. Nope. Um, so that one I actually have a little tougher time. So we have Vodaci, which is kind of like Italy. There's kind of an England and an Avalon. Uh, the Sarmatian Commonwealth, and I want to get this straight from the horse's mouth, is this kind of like Poland equivalent, or is it more of generally Eastern European in a way? Well, at the time, uh, the... Uh the Lithuanian uh, Poland Polish Commonwealth uh, that is the main that is the main source of inspiration for the Sarmatian Commonwealth okay. uh, and uh, mainly becomes because many many years ago I, I was invited to Poland okay. of all places as a special gaming guest for for a convention they and when I got good games out there in Europe absolutely that doesn't surprise me at all so when I got there I uh, I was I was uh, I was pleasantly surprised by the amount of people who knew who I was um, and were excited to see me. However, the question I got over and over and over again is, why is there no Poland? In <laughs> I, I feel like you'd get those questions in Portugal as well. I kind of feel for Portugal has just been kind of been subsumed into... Uh, into, uh, into Castile. Castile, yeah, in a way. Yeah, yeah wait, wait for it. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so what's also very exciting is that... Um, I think previously there in first edition there was even kind of a metagame explanation of you can't really get to the first world. I mean, sorry, the new world. Haha. -ha. Yeah. First world. You can't really get to America. There was kind of this some sort of way to blocking you. Not anymore, or I don't know if maybe that'll be addressed, but there's going to be a whole new world source book. In fact, there's gonna be a couple, I think, right? Um, That's right. There's a there's a new world source book which um, uh, is is in edits right now. 
And uh, it's very exciting because the New World Sourcebook is being written by people who, like, have master's degrees in Mesoamerican culture. Yes. And so it's really neat to to uh, to watch them uh, write about, you know, the the Aslan Empire and, I, I, yes. uh, and things like that. It's really what part of the game that really appeals to me and I think would appeal to anybody who's a big fan of uh, uh, what do they call it? Alt history yeah. kind of fiction and things like that. Right. Like um, uh, Jonathan's or Dr. Strange and Jonathan. Mr. Oh, Norrell. Mr. Norrell. Sorry, yeah, that's sorry. one book. There's a whole bunch of them. There's that one written, uh, Anno Dracula is written from this viewpoint of like, what if, you know, uh, Dracula was real, but it was, everything else was the same. Or the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen take where it's like, let's take a very, very grounded, very, very realistic world and let's make a couple fantastical tweaks to it. Um, mm-hmm. So I am really excited to see what you guys do with that. Uh, and I also think it speaks to the depth of reality you guys bring into this game that I think personally really makes it tick like where we're talking about chronometers, like that's important to this RPG world and a chronometer coming into existence will have these real impactful game worthy events that happen. Yep. That said, uh, there's also magic. It's not just about the realism. It's all in service of, to use that word again, swashbuckling. They'll sort of like get out your swords, you know, swing through some uh, stained glass windows, fight some, you know, corrupted cardinals and things like that. Um, So this magic system Something I really enjoy about it is if you've ever played D&D, just forget everything you know about magic that you learned in D&D. It's, <laughs> it's about each country has its own totally unique form of magic. It can be absolutely unbalanced and game breaking, but there's also and always goes hand in hand a cost. That's kind of seems to be the, the key to magic in this world where yeah. there's it's not just power for free and you're not a wizard in a pointy hat. You have this very culturally specific viewpoint that arises from that culture um and you've made some tweaks to the magic system between first edition and second edition which i thought is interesting um necromancy or i'm sorry hexenworken in yep. uh, eisen is that new for second edition or was it that, is that is what uh what led you to kind of tweak that i also noticed the usurins now have a little bit of a different take on magic they're kind of more nature focused it seems like and then the sarmatian commonwealth has this very interesting sort of devil worshiping magic well, uh, I mean, not devil worshiping, kind of more deals with the devil. Yep. Can you just speak a little bit about uh, why you decided to tweak that magic system, um, if there's well, a reason? At, at the time, I'm a, my first role playing game was Call of Cthulhu, and the one of the things that I love about that game is that the magic system doesn't make sense. Yeah. yeah right. And and it's not <laughs> that's that's a feature, not a bug. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. The theme of of Cthulhu is that the the world, uh, the universe does is too big for man to totally comprehend yeah and so the magic system is too big for man to totally comprehend right it's it's man fiddling with the very nature of the universe and what a catastrophic error that is Mm -hmm. right yeah and so when we did first edition 7c i wanted the magic to feel like that i wanted it to feel like this big mess and it was a big mess and, and uh, you know, for good and ill. And so when we tackled second edition, I wanted to maintain the feel of that, right? The, the, the yeah. themes of that, but give, but let the players use it in a very simple way. So hmm. all of the magic, none of it has anything to do with dice rolls. Right. It's you spend a hero point and it works and that's it. It's you're done. It right? keeps it feeling but, very magical. Definitely. Yeah. But the cost of the magic because all of the magics have their own cost. That's what makes them unique and distinct. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that's about all I can really say about the magic system if you haven't experienced it. It is really cool, um, and I do love how culturally unique they are. Uh, but that kind of leads me into talking a little bit about, uh, you say we, you don't use dice for the magic. In fact, the way the dice system used, is used in this game is something really unique to me in terms of what I've been playing in other RPG systems. The original first edition system used the roll and keep dice mechanic, which I think was based on uh, uh, Legend of the Five Rings. It was the same one AEG had in that. Yep. Um, so obviously you've moved to, you've changed publishers to you now, right? I think you are the, the publisher yeah. of, of your system. And I'm, you, I'm the, uh, the 100% owner. <laughs> good for you. Absolutely. Um, but, that's but yeah, when we when we're looking at the the system, we uh, uh, we 
uh, when we first started playtesting, I, I said, okay, I took my little playtest crew and I said, we're going to make characters from first edition with no changes. Okay. None. We're going to play, we're going to play the game the way it's written for a few sessions before we start thinking about changes. We didn't get 40 minutes into character creation before I said, stop. <laughs> we are starting with a clean piece of paper. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Because the system was so, it's such an artifact of the 90s. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> so. I think that's an interesting thing to say because I feel like uh, this new system feels very much like an artifact of now, not artifact of now, but a product of the modern times, which is that it's much more, I feel like, narratively focused and players at the table and the GM kind of interpreting a story between the dice themselves. Um, and for those of you who don't know the system, I'll explain it. Um, it's a, a, a raise based system. I don't know if you have a better term for it than that. Um, well, essentially, the, the way that I boil it down when I pitch it to new players is that um, we used to do role, role trait plus skill keep trait, and now it's trait plus skill keep everything. Yes. Because that's what Errol Flynn would do. He yeah. would keep all of his dice. Yeah, it's very um, swashbuckly, yeah. So then what I say is that the Game Master presents a scene, and then the players roll dice, and then they use their dice to change elements of the scene. So if there are guards trying to attack you, you can use your dice to say, well, we knock out the guards and now the guards are no longer trying to attack us. You've changed the scene. Mm-hmm. Or you could use your dice to set the room on fire because that changes the scene. Or you could yeah. use your dice to say, oh, and then we see a hidden panel in the wall and that changes the scene, right? Interesting, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So this is, uh, yeah, it's very much more of a communal storytelling approach is what I found. So I've, I've been able to play it a little bit. It, gone through uh, uh, some of the games here. I've sat down with people for character creation. I've been playing it a little bit. Um, and yeah, I find it really a totally different mindset that I have to get into uh, uh, as the GM when I'm running it. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's the, the system basically is, so you're going to have uh, a handful of D10s. It uses the D10. We roll those up. So let's say my character is a fairly strong, fairly athletic guy and I want to uh, jump off the back balcony of my ship or of the evil pirate ship, swing on a rope and smash through the back window of the cabin's quarters and burst in. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's not a difficulty number or anything like that I'm trying to beat. What I do is I roll my handful of D10s and I see how many sets of 10 I can make out of that by adding the numbers together. So I might add a three and an eight. Okay, that makes more than 10, so that's fine. That's one set. And I just keep doing that until I have as many sets of 10 as I can make. And those are my raises. And then on my turn, I can start spending those raises to influence the world. And so it's as simple as me saying, well, basically the, the game master is going to give me a little feedback and correct me if I, if I am wrong, John, because obviously you know this game <laughs> better than I do. <laughs> but, so I would be like, okay, do you want to jump off this uh, railing with this rope? That might be a raise. You want to smash through this window successfully. I might call that another raise. Mm-hmm. And yep. then... Um, I'm going to add some consequences to this role because as the GM, I've got to make it difficult for you. You can't get away with everything. So I might say you would take uh, two points of damage uh, from crashing through this glass window unless you spend a raise for each point of damage. That's right. Yeah, so it'd be like, okay, so I need to spend four raises total. And then you kind of smash through, and then if I had four raises, that's no problem. Right. Yeah, so, the the key to the system is is there's a couple things that make the system really, really cook. And one of them is consequences. And that's the idea that the GM says, look, you can do whatever you want in this in this scene. You, you can, you know, you, you, you're a big damn hero. You can do whatever you want. However, consequences represent prices that you have to pay or costs you have to pay in order to do that. Yeah. For example, there are guards in this room and they're shooting at you. You can run across the room, grab the, grab the purloined letter Kiss the girl, grab the uh, grab the chandelier, swing across the chandelier, and crash out the window and land in the hay bale down below. That's fine, but you're going to take five wounds from the guard shooting at you. Yeah, right. And yeah. so the player has to evaluate. Go, okay, how many of these things do I really want to get away with, as opposed to and and counter that with how much do I want the consequence to go through? Yes. And you know, and and a lot of it, it's. I was just running the game in New York at a, in Buffalo and at a convention and somebody told me afterwards, they said, you know, 
you really can't fail in your system. And I said, that's right. You can just not deal with consequences. Right. Yeah. The only way you can fail, I think, is by your character can say, I choose to fail. And then yes. that is kind of, a, and when, by doing that, it gives your character this hero point, which is kind of a, uh, you spend your little pool of hero points to do even more amazing heroic things, like okay. active yes. magic ability. So Yeah, when, when you choose for your character to fail, you get a resource that makes you more awesome. And I would like yeah. to say, so this is where the big mindset change for me was when I started playing this. In D&D, which I think is everybody's touchstone, it's a I game think, about it's a game about murdering people who don't look like you, so you can take their stuff. Yes, it's <laughs> the game of murder hobos. Yes, which which is always fun. Right. Uh, but uh, a successful dice roll. So if I go, okay, it's my turn. Great, uh, I'm gonna roll my die, and I manage to stab the dragon for one fifteenth of its total health. Like a successful dice roll in D and D takes you forward about this much. In seventh C on your turn, what you just described, which was smash through a window. Uh, grab the purloined letter, kiss the princess, jump out through the window and land in the hay bale. That is, that could all happen on your turn, essentially. That's like five raises. That's and a standard action. That's a standard yeah. action. And so on your turn in 7th C, you're going this much. It's this huge leap in action. So as a DM, I just, or a GM, I had to be really prepared to be like, whoa, okay, this scene is over. Like, I have yeah. to, I have to have my pockets bursting with ideas and opportunities and consequences because if they they are going to kill every guard in this palace, have the princess and be out the window uh, by the end of this round once everybody is gone, right. basically. Yep. Um, so that's something I wanted to ask you about because in the core rule book, uh, I feel like that was the one spot I was looking for a little more guidance that I didn't quite see, and I was I'm looking forward to some of the supplements and all the other stuff that's going to come out the guided play. But in terms of running the game, in terms of using up heroes' raises, I found myself in situations where heroes, I would be like, uh, let's go back to that original example of, okay, swing through the back window of the cabin, land inside. And that's as far as she wanted to, or yeah, basically that's as far as she'd taken it. I'm like, okay, let's see her. So you rolled six raises. So I was like, okay, so one to grab the rope, one to get through the window. I'll do a couple points of damage to you. And then I kind of had about two raises left over that I was uncertain what to do. So if, if you're running a game, John, and a player is left, like rolls some tremendous roll and has like six or seven raises on it, what what is your approach to kind of using up these raises? Or is it okay to just leave a player with a couple unspent raises? I mean, how, I guess how would you uh, approach that situation? A couple different ways. I mean, the uh, um, the couple unspent raises is fine. Right. Yeah. It's like you did more than you needed to, you know, and yeah. you looked very good doing it. <laughs> but, but also, I mean, it really comes down to a lot of improvisation. Yeah. Right. It comes down to you get into the room and, um, you know, uh, you get into the room and there's a safe in the room. Yes. Oh, what do I do with that? I don't know. You get into the room and there's guards in the room. Great. So, you know, you. Are, are would those be examples of opportunities and consequences, or is that just you sort of being like, um, like those aren't necessarily saying there's a safe in the room isn't me spending one of their raises. That's just me giving them a little more information and prodding them to maybe spend yeah. a raise to check it out. Yeah, and and always give them multiple choices. It's it's you always give the players multiple choices. Like you land in the room, there's guards and a safe, and uh, there's a woman tied to a chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, you know, or or in, you know, some cases there's a man tied to the chair. <laughs> what is that about? I mean, you know, type thing. So, you know, when you see you see that the player is, is rolling and you see they go, I have six raises and that should immediately tell you, oh, OK, I have to add things, you know. Yeah. And yes, exactly. That, that's I think there's so there's this level of, of flexibility and agility and improv that's really important to get yourself in that mindset when you when you're running a game. Right. And what and one of the things that we're doing with the game master screen that's coming out um, early late this year or early next year is that the game master screen, rather than having charts and numbers and things, is going to have a huge have, you know, two at least two of the panels dedicated to consequences and opportunities Oh, that I'm going to love to see. So it'll be, you know, it'll be a huge list and then you'll go and, oh, I need something. And you just look down the list and, and you can pull things off of that. 
I mentioned, I just want to explain this for people who may be unfamiliar. Uh, consequences I've touched a little bit, that's like, or, or like you said, that's the five points of damage you're going to take from the guards shooting you. And you can yeah, but it's also things like I, I was I was on a, I was I was running a game on a pirate ship and uh, mm -hmm. and I said that the uh, the ship you're trying to take has just turned its cannons down and they're pointing at your hull mm -hmm. and they're going to sink the ship unless you do something about that and doing something about that is going to require at least five raises. It's going to require five raises to take care of that. Okay. Otherwise, your ship is going to sink. Mm -hmm. Right. Love it. And then you, uh, yeah, exactly. So consequences can be anything, um, but they generally, they require you to spend raises and it might be as few as one raise to negate one wound, or it might be as many as five raises to prevent these cannons from blasting off. Um, the other side of consequences is opportunities. And so this is something else that the, uh, the game master will be, or the referee or whatever we want to call him. This is something else that the, the GM throws in, uh, to also spend raises on, where you could be like, okay, uh, there are something really good that's here, but you have to spend a raise or it, you lose it. Like, um, I think the example in the book is the room's on fire. You notice across the room there's like a, a letter, a secret letter that's going to be catching and burning in the flames. So you might want to spend your raise on that as opposed to a raise on jumping out the window. Yeah, you can also create opportunities for other players to take, take advantage of. Uh, for example, somebody uh, was... Uh, running through a room and there was a, a display of swords. And he said, I grab the display and I break it over my leg and throw it into the room and swords spill all <laughs> over the room. And, and he said, I want to spit, make an opportunity for other players to have weapons because they didn't have weapons at the yeah, time. Yeah, that's right. And I was like, great. All you need to do is spend a raise and you have a sword. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, definitely. Definitely. Okay, that's great. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing the GM screen. Uh, do you have a, an, a date, roughly, when you guys think you'll have some of this stuff out? I know it's Kickstarter, and that's a whole, uh, <laughs> it's a whole thing. Uh, but, well, uh, we, we, uh, the, the Heroes and Villains book um, just went to editing. Oh, great. And uh, that's going to be 40 villains and 40 heroes uh, for you to look at. And it corresponds with the Heroes and Villains decks. Okay. Should be decks of cards that have those 40 villains and 40 heroes in them. So as a GM, you can say, and then you run into this person and hold up the card and show it to them. Yep. And it'll have the full the full portrait, uh, you know, the full body portrait, color portrait of that character. Great. Right. And then the book has two pages devoted to either that hero or that villain. Yep. Right. That's awesome. So that's that's going that's in editing right now, and will that, that should. Happen. Sorry, will that yeah. include uh, stat blocks for these uh, uh, enemies as well? I know that the uh, it seems like it's a much more streamlined system for uh, running villains uh, than it was in first edition, where you just kind of have two numbers. Yep, villains in Seventh C have two numbers, which are strength and influence, and I like using Robin Hood for the Robin Hood villains for this. Is that. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, strength represents how tough the villain is and influence represents how much influence they have. Um, uh, Prince John, the phony king of England, his strength is very, very low. He, he's a wimp. But his influence is very great because mm -hmm. he controls all of Britain, right? Yeah. Meanwhile, the sheriff of Nottingham, he's pretty tough. He's a tough cookie. Um, but his influence is really low because he's, well, he's just the sheriff of Nottingham. Cool. And uh, what happens is that villains uh, have a have a villainy rating that's based on those two numbers. You add those two numbers together, and a villain's villainy could be as low as five, or it could be as high as thirty. And when you encounter, when you confront that villain, that villain gets to roll a number of dice equal to their villainy. Right. Okay. So if you confront Prince John, the phony king of England, and he has a twenty-five villainy, <laughs> that represents all of his guards and all of the nobles who are loyal to him and the sheriff of Nottingham and the cat, you know, everything, yeah. which means that you get captured and thrown into jail so you can get rescued by your merry men. Right. Yes. That, so that was, that's going to be great. I'm looking forward to seeing that book. Um, will we be seeing, I, I know you address this a little bit on the Kickstarter. Uh, will we be seeing some adventure? I know there's a couple, um, I think cities of event cities of adventure. Yeah. Is, is one of the core books that'll be coming out at some point or one of the supplemental books. Um, will you be publishing some standalone adventures as well for people uh, in the interim? Well, standalone adventures are actually kind of hard to do with this game, and mm -hmm. I don't like standalone adventures anyway. 
Hmm. Um, I, ever since, you know, one of the things that John Zinzer, the guy who owns AEG and I bonded over very early when I started working there was that as game masters, we had both had the same, the same attitude towards adventures. We would buy them. Right. And, you know, way back when, when you could buy C1, the caverns of yeah. Sokan. You know, <laughs> yep. I love that one. And we would essentially read through them and like steal things out of them yeah. and leave the stuff that we didn't like and then make our own, you know, and like improvise our own adventures around them. Yeah. So, and uh, so that's not something you you would like to do in Seventh C is is come out with those kind of adventure books. You prefer to just have people cobble their own together. Well, I wrote an adventure uh, for my Wicked Words Patreon that never that that, that hasn't come out yet. Oh. Uh, I've been kind of busy doing other things, but uh, the adventure is essentially two thousand words. Wow! And that's it. It's really light. There's a setup. Um, and uh, I re- I've been running the adventure for a lot of different groups, and every time I run it. The outcome, like not only the outcome, but like everything after the setup is different. It's it's completely different because of the way the system works, because players can introduce elements into it. Mm-hmm. You as a game master don't want to have a lot of backstory. You don't want to have a plan. You want to have contingencies. Right. And so the adventures are kind of written that way that here is the setup. Here are different ways that this could go. And here are some possible resolutions, but your players, I mean, we all know what happens is that no adventure survives c- the first contact with the players. <laughs> no. Right. Yeah. Sometimes. So, yeah. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> so why even, and, and whenever you try to force them back on the path that you've planned, they go, screw you, we're going this way. And you might as well just throw the adventure out. Yeah. Right. So. I, I really don't see any point in, in adventures like that unless there's something really linear like like a, a dungeon or, you know, or or something like that. But sure. what I like doing is I like presenting environments, sandbox environments the players can play in mm-hmm. with story hooks and relationships yeah. and all of those things and then throw those at the players. You definitely and, see that in your system, definitely. Yeah. Okay, um, just because I know we've got just a few minutes left here, I think, before we, we need to wrap up tonight, sadly. Um, there's one question I kind of want to ask you that um, uh, you commented on several times back in the first edition uh, around the time that came out. You had this kind of comment that uh, no one, no publishers ever charge enough for their game books. Uh, I think you're, and your kind of take on that, I think, if I read it right, is that there's this immense amount of effort that goes into designing a game. Right, like yeah. both mental effort and then the actual just putting it together, uh, and then the game books also provide a amount of replayability in one game book that no other form of entertainment gets close to. Right, like you can watch a movie and that's just a few hours, but I mean, you know, I, you purchase the Seventh Sea game book and that's going to be years. You know, I purchased I, my first role playing game I, I bought was Call of Cthulhu. I still have the box over on my shelf. Yeah, and that was in 1981. I could I still run Call of Cthulhu. You know, I yeah. mean, granted, I have I have new editions of it, but I can run the game with that edition for, for since 1981. So now that you're the now that you're the publisher of your own game. Yeah. Do you feel you're charging enough for it? <laughs> it's well, you charge as much as the market will bear. Yes. Right. Yeah. I think that that the the new uh, uh, Invisible Sun Kickstarter mm-hmm. is very interesting, isn't it? Yes. Uh, because I want. I want to see what that does because right now, like there is a set, right in set theory, right? There is a set called board games, mm-hmm. right? And players can buy a nineteen ninety five, uh, nineteen dollars and ninety five cent edition of Clue, right? Right, and take that home, and that is a board game, and they will sit it right next to their eighty dollar edition of Dead of Winter, right? Right, mm-hmm. and both of those are board games. Right. They fit the same set. It's right. just some costs twenty dollars and some cost eighty dollars and some cost one hundred and twenty dollars. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, can we have a role playing game that's one hundred and ninety seven dollars? Can we do that? And and can 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 because right now yeah. I feel board gamers feel that buying a twenty dollar game and an eighty dollar game are just like essentially the same thing. Right. It's, yeah. That, that, I think you're right. I think Invisible Sun is going to live and die by people's impressions of it, by the reviews, and people are either going to say, this was worth every cent of $197, this really is a premium experience that bears that out, or people are going to say, uh, 
I don't know, just throwing a few extra tokens and cards into the box. I don't know if this is worth it. Um, I mean, there, there was a time when the term premium board game existed. Uh-huh. And that term doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. It's just a board game. It's what we expect from board games, yeah. right? I want to know if that meme can cross over into the set of RPGs. When we go, that's a premium role-playing game. As opposed to, no, I've just bought a role-playing game. Well, the, the Kickstarter for Invisible Sun, I believe, is totally bearing it out so far because they've definitely well exceeded their goal. So it'll be interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so before we go, John, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate the, the time tonight. This is, and I've got way more questions to ask you, but um, <laughs> maybe sometime in the future we can, maybe when more of the core rule books come out, we can schedule something else if that works for you. That would be awesome. Uh, but... Um, you, you were talking about for an adventure, what you really like is relationships and settings and scenes. Um, yeah. We're going to be playing some Seventh Sea on our end, and I was wondering if you could suggest for us, uh, let's call it just, say, five five words that you could suggest that we will somehow use to construct an adventure. So maybe, like, a place, a person, an object, uh, and then two more of those things, whatever you like. Whatever comes to mind, whatever maybe some of your favorite aspects are or favorite NPCs favorite locations and then we will we will have some adventure that involves all five of those okay um how about um pirate ship good one does that count as one word <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah that's one uh, uh let's see pirate ship uh uh escaped slave Ooh, okay reward okay and uh pirate hunters Pirate Hunters. Mm. Great. All right. Thank you so much. This was really fun tonight. I wish, like I said, I, I, I've got questions I could just ask you for hours, but uh, I unfortunately cannot do that. This well, evening. We like to we like to respect people's time, but we could absolutely keep going for for forever. I think yeah. on, on these things. This is so fascinating. I love I love talking about this stuff. Yeah, and th- I haven't even I, really been talking. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you didn't even ask me about chess as a role-playing game, so that, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> we'll have to bring it up next time. I hope we can schedule something like this again. Thanks so much for, for coming and joining us. It really is personally a big thrill for me to be able to talk to you and get some of your, your actual thoughts on uh, things like the how the system works. So I think that's really amazing. That's great. Thank, yeah. thank no you, problem. Thank you so much, John. Thank you again. Take Bye. care, guys. Oh, uh, and and we're out. No, not really. But um, <laughs> uh, if you're ever in L.A. or anything and you want to swing by, we've got a studio that we play games in, and uh, we'll be playing some 7th C coming up here pretty soon and stuff. But we'd yeah. love to have you swing by if you'd ever want to play. Uh, for We play live uh, on Twitch and stuff. So yeah. if you ever want to play with uh, for our audience and all that stuff, just uh, come, on, come on down. We'd be happy to have well, you. I'll did you guys it. see the uh, the shoot that we did for the for the Seven C mini movie or short you know short film? Uh, I saw the little short film. Did you shoot that out here? We did. We shot it in L.A. and I'm going back out to L.A. for the editing. Oh wow, cool! So um, I will let you guys know when I'm out there. Great. That, that would be awesome. I'll yeah. send you a link with uh, I guess our stuff in it, and you, so you can check us out a little bit. But yeah, we yeah. have a we have a little studio space that we record in, and uh, it would be a real thrill. Yeah. to have you down there. I, I would That'd flip be amazing. Out. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much, John. Yeah, thanks no a lot, problem. John. We'll speak with you soon. Take care, guys. Yeah, All lots right. of luck. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Great. That was great. I do wish I could have talked to him for a lot longer, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, we could, we could have. It's just, you know, at, at a certain point, it's like, well, we could do an hour and a half and then cut it shorter yeah. you know it's like you know where where is the thing yeah it's also always better to leave on a high note instead of chatting with yeah. him until he's kind of like oh man i kind of want to eat the rest of my dinner yeah yeah i know those artichokes <laughs> look good
Um, I'm glad his video didn't come through. There's no way we could have if we were oh, shooting yeah. him as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm, Here's John Wick. Notice, watch him eat ears of corn. He would, I'm really he hoping that it that it worked though. I, that it came through okay. Uh, let me see here. So it's just us. We would see, right? No, we'll see. We were recording both. Oh, we were recording. Yeah, both. yeah, yeah. Oh, I yeah. thought you said. Oh, so he couldn't he see us. See, he can't see oh. us. Oh, yeah. Oh, but oh, but oh. We, yeah. The recording can see both. Uh, where does this Thank go? Thank you go? for letting me come by and do this. Yeah, it's great I, that you have this set. Like I said, I really hope that it that it worked okay. Okay, I hope so too. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that was cool. Is, he is. This uh, is that's the.